All right, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. And we have as our special guest today, Mufi Hanneman. Hi, Mufi. Thank you for joining the show. Hello, Jay. Always great to connect with you. The same here. So, you know, we, we selected an interesting title for this discussion. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's how in the world can we restart Hawaii's tourism industry here in Community Matters? And you're the perfect guy to talk about that. You're in the middle with HLTA. Uh, you've seen it come and you need to, you, you need to see it go. I'm, I'm talking about COVID. Um, so the, I guess the first question is, from where you sit, you know, how how's the tur tourism industry doing or not right now? Well, we uh, are, are in an interesting situation. You know, Jay, we spent a lot of time uh, when things are normal, trying to make sure that when we're competing on that world stage, that we are basically um, emphasizing all the things that makes us a very special place to live, work, and play, and visit. Uh, it's our weather, it's our people, it's our culture, it's our environment. Uh, and so now we've had to, because of uh, COVID-19, it's kind of put a screeching halt to all of that. And to tell people, stay home now. Aloha later. Uh, and that has been um, a rallying cry for all of us. And I know it sounds kind of, wow, they're actually not asking tourists to come here? Well, I think first and foremost, the interest and the priority is the people of this state. Uh, you know, that has to weigh far and above any other aspect of, you know, yes, we're taking big financial losses. Yes, people are out of work. But if we don't reassure uh, ourselves, the people who inhabit the 808, that we will be doing all we can to ensure uh, safety, security, health, that we are one of the safest and healthiest places to live, then all these efforts will be for naught. And so we are really uh, doing our part to try to make sure that those hotels that are open for a variety of reasons are operating uh, in making sure that their places of work and their environment is clean, sanitized, taking all the necessary steps, also complying with the quarantine law. And then those that are not operating, uh, certainly they're trying to find creative ways to engage uh, their furloughed employees, whether it's feeding them. Uh, as I found out this morning, one of our wonderful general managers out in Kauai, the Sheraton uh, Kauai Resort, every Friday, he basically asks his furloughed employees to come with their families and they'll feed them dinner. So those are the kind of things that we're trying to do uh, in reaching out to the community. We at HLTA has done this Heroes Hotel for Heroes program, thanks to the strong support of Chris Tatum and Hawaii Tourism Authority, where our first responders, uh, members of our healthcare professional community are given a day to and a night to decompress away from their families uh, so that uh, they can have peace of mind, their families can have peace of mind. Uh, we recently launched a campaign uh, on a video called uh, Stay Home Now, Aloha Later. Uh, lots of celebrities participated in it, local entertainment, to get that message out. And thanks to KHON, they made it possible uh, to basically tell people this is not the time to visit Hawaii. And by the way, why don't you buy a ribbon uh, that will entitle you to some discount uh, when you come here and in addition contribute so that we can help our furloughed employees. So very different change of culture, but nonetheless still dedicated to the fact that we're committed to our home here in Hawaii and we want to make it a safe and healthy place. Yeah, just a, a question that comes to mind is, uh, what are you going to do this year about the visitor industry walk? Uh, that's very important for a lot of people. So query, can you have that? Yeah, can you make them, you know, stand apart from each other? Does, does that qualify in the lockdown or what? Yes, well, we're going to have to see what the rules are. But right now we've rescheduled it during the, the perfect month. And that's the month of Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So we hope to uh, be able to have that walk on all, all six islands uh, come November, beginning on the 7th, the 14th, the 21st. But we'll have to see what the whole new world order is going to be in terms of social distancing, maybe modify that walk, maybe do a virtual walk, what have you. But we, we still want to help the nonprofit groups uh, who we've helped uh, over the years uh, mm -hmm. who need, uh, need our assistance in addition to what they receive from their own fundraising efforts or from government. Okay, I, I, you know, that is important. I'm glad you're you know, leaving it open as an option. Who knows? It'd be great if we can do it. You know? And right now, no, nobody can tell. No, nobody can tell. Nobody here, and certainly, certainly nobody in Washington can tell. Uh, so the question, the question is uh, to unpack a little on what it takes 
um, to you know to to do the kinds of things you were talking about in terms of preserving the the hotel properties, in terms of preserving the uh, the staff of these hotels. For example, you know I heard this morning on our show with uh, Lanai that Pulau Lanai um, is keeping everybody in the payroll, whether they work or not. That's a European style. And the thought is, uh, you know, they don't want to see them go off the side during during the duration, and um, they want to have them available, you know, when it's time to bring them back into the hotels. Um, is that happening, generally speaking, or is that, uh, you know, just one example? Well, I, I think what, in general, I think what the bottom line of all the employers is to maintain their health benefits. So if we cannot gainfully employ them now, if we can't give them the hours that they're used to, obviously we're looking to what government can assist with, with the CARES Act in Washington DC and also what we can do here locally. But I think at the end of the day, we really want to maintain their health benefits. So most of them uh, are continuing, uh, if not all of them are getting their health benefits, but after a while that well dries up. And so this is where government has to step in. And I know that um, there's been numerous activities or initiatives that they've launched to make sure that they're fed, uh, that their ohana of employees are taken care of as much as they can. We're also trying to find work for them during this time uh, to keep them engaged. And that has been possible because one of the provisions of the CARES Act, if you qualify for the PPP, you have to keep your workers working. Uh, so that's an opportunity to perhaps have some of them come and do some of the work that we uh, have uh, need for. And because of a reduced workforce, uh, obviously having everybody kind of sharing that information and the like. But, um, you know, everybody's hurting. Even management has uh, also has to be furloughed. Their hours are reduced. And so we're very concerned about all of that, keeping a close watch on how we can get help uh, from the appropriate places. But recognizing at the end of the day, it's uh, your responsibility to look after your family. But mm -hmm. I can't say enough about what they're all doing individually to ensure that nobody is really suffering. And if they are, they are chipping in uh, to see how we can help collectively. What about Local 5? Are they, are they happy, unhappy? Are they engaged with you in trying to figure out some mutual understanding on this? Well, both Local 5 and the, and the ILWU, those are the two major hotel employee unions. Yep, they, they're, they're going, working overtime uh, to make sure that uh, their furloughed employees uh, are uh, in a good place, seeing what they can do, especially now some of them are contributing ideas uh, to how we can protect the workers, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And that's important. Uh, then also looking for us to uh, help uh, coordinate uh, lobbying activities when we see a particular measure that might be floating before a council, uh, not so much at the state at this time, uh, that could be harmful or could be of benefit uh, they're reaching out uh, and asking us to join uh, and lobby with them and present testimony. So uh, there's a good open door relationship uh, with both uh, major unions that uh, are associated with our uh, hotel workers. Uh, ILWU is primarily on the neighbor islands, a few exceptions here. Um, Local 5 is primarily here in Oahu with a few exceptions on the neighbor islands. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned also about, um, you know, making sure everything was hygienic, making sure the staff, such as it is in the hotels, they call it the cleaning staff because they're probably engaged for the most part in cleaning, I mean, cleaning COVID out. Um, but what, what does that entail? You know, I, I have the vision of, um, you know, people who were in the maintenance staff, so the service house uh, service staffs, um, going around and making sure that all surfaces are clean. Uh, that there's no possibility um, that a virus could be left behind. Because I, I say why I think this, uh, I think this, in the end of the day, Hawaii is going to have to demonstrate to the world that it's clean. That when we open the gates again, we want the world to think that when they come back here, there's really no risk of infection by anybody in any hotel. So how do you achieve that? And what is the staff doing about it? Do you know? Well, that's an excellent point, Jay. I'd say by and large, uh, even before uh, COVID-19, uh, we, we had a, a reputation for being a very safe and clean place uh, to visit, uh, to dwell, uh, to partake, uh, what have you. So that's sort of in our DNA. 
Uh, and we want to be able to maintain that reputation because going forward, that's what every traveler is going to look at. That's what we as travelers are going to look at if we want to travel outside of Hawaii. You know, how are they maintaining standards? How do I know that when I go into that country, uh, I'm going to feel safe and secure? So a lot of effort has been placed on that. You know, quarantines have been very new, uh, a new uh, uh, element here in, in, uh, in the hospitality industry and amongst our residents, plain and simple. Uh, so uh, making sure that um, as quarantine laws are enacted, uh, really going the extra mile uh, to make sure that whoever is being quarantined or self-isolation is not gonna come in contact uh, with our uh, in this case, hospitality workers, uh, making sure that all the things that were uh, part of the normal order now, whether it's face masks, sanitizers, all those things are important. Uh, the same things that you say that we put out there about washing your hands or always wiping down the surface, uh, that's being done. Uh, and also now, because uh, we want to be able to one day welcome back people, uh, certainly we're taking into account what can we do uh, to assure that visitor who's coming here is going to feel healthy and safe. And most importantly, how do our workers we want to make them and feel uh, in a good place? So things like thermal screens, uh, to me, might be the order of the day. Uh, thermal screens at the airports, thermal screens uh, at the hotels to check someone's temperature. Uh, and then also coming up with uh, protocols to say, what if uh, someone who checks in or during the stay uh, turns up ill or sick? Uh, as you know, sometimes these viruses take a few days to manifest itself. Uh, you know, how are we going to approach that? Do we, do we have a separate wing set aside just for those type of uh, customers? So these are the kinds of things that are taking place right now. Very pleased with the proactive efforts that the individual hotels or the brands are doing. What I want to do is kind of bring them all together uh, and then we'll pick the, the best of the best practices or one that we feel that Number one, will make government officials comfortable uh, and confident in what we're doing, but most of all, make the people of Hawaii feel that, okay, if they, if they get off the plane and they're healthy, I know when they check into a hotel, uh, they're gonna maintain those standards. Oh, when they visit restaurants, oh, when they go to the beaches and the parks. So really what's important too, is that the airline's stepping up and doing what they need to do. We don't want sick people traveling to Hawaii. And conversely, we as people should not be traveling elsewhere if we're sick. Because we know in the examples that we have seen, uh, it's not just visitors that are bringing the virus here. It's local people traveling to the mainland who have yep. brought it back. We know that. Yeah. So it works both ways. It cuts both ways. That being said, um, we're uh, very uh, grateful to see Hawaiian Airlines also start proactively to put together what they think is important for people to undergo before they come here. And then certainly I think there's another opportunity uh, for the state uh, officials at the airport to also do some kind of, uh, not a test if you will, but some kind of check uh, to make sure that people now that are actually going to leave the airport and head into wherever they're gonna be domiciled, that that's in place. Yeah. Temperature, so, at, temperature at the least. Cooperation. Yeah. And I think the fact that we can do this uh, in a parallel path is gonna be very important. Temperature at the least. I, I, I saw an ad, uh, I want to say it was Amazon for uh, one of those temperature readers, a, a little pistol reader that you see. And in, in, it's, it's 60 bucks. It's not expensive to do that. You can set up a, a screening station for nearly nothing in cash. Uh, but the, I wanted to ask you this. I've, I wondered about this myself. So if we have, we've, we've had the paper reported, that we've had something like 3,700 uh, tourists visit. Hawaii in the past what few weeks I don't know what period that is um, and they were they're all subject or most all subject to a two-week uh, quarantine uh, and I suppose they have to play that out in the hotels um, so here's here's a person who would normally take a shorter vacation here's a person who's um, you know under a lockdown for two weeks here's a person who wants to get out on a beach you know he wants to do what tourists want to do, you know, of Hawaii, the beauty, the romance of Hawaii, and he's in his room. How in the world do we enforce that so that he's not sneaking out and doing exactly what tourists always want to do? How do we stop him from doing that? Well, that's why, uh, Jay, I, I think 
somebody's out of their cotton picking mind to try to come and visit Hawaii now. Uh, they really should stay home now. And so folks have said, well, the cheap airfares are enticement, or they'd rather quarantine here uh, than uh, quarantine in New York City or what have you. That being the case, um, we were the first state to issue a 14-day quarantine. Uh, the governor did that. So we cannot guarantee as much as we would like to guarantee that that person is not going to be kolohe and try to bend the rules. So as much as they're trying in the hotels uh, to provide that security or that checkpoint, uh, we have said to them now, now that uh, it's been uh, in place for a few weeks, the state has also strengthened its quarantine laws uh, and how they are going to react. So the police department should be called right away. Anytime they just notice somebody stepping out of their room, they're not paying attention, they're trying to walk out of the hotel, call the police. We also note that the community is also doing that. Uh, you know, one of the things that if you know with the law enforcement officials through the year is finding people willing to testify or to say, I saw that. They don't want to be that personal witness. Well, they're more willing to come out now because they're saying, wow, they're going to affect us yep. uh, if they're supposed to be quarantining. Yep. Uh, the state has also stepped up its efforts at the airport that I think is going to make it easier to enforce it because now they're really asking the hard questions. But more importantly, they're asking you to verify it. So if you come in and you say, I have a reservation at so-and-so, uh, they're going to actually call in advance to see whether that is confirmed, whether that's legit. And if they say, I'm going to stay at a residence because now vacation rental should not be operating at this time, they're actually going to say, oh, you, where are you staying at? What's the residence? What's the number? That person cannot leave to uh, basically their destination unless that can be verified. So they're placed in another line. And then they have two choices if we find out, you know what? That's not true for what you're saying. They can either turn around and go back or they're going to get uh, have to deal with our law enforcement officials and possibly face a fine or maybe even put them in jail. Yeah, the fine, what I read about a fine, $5,000. That's that's serious money. Uh, maybe some would be willing to pay it, but it's still serious money. You know, I was, I'm going to ask you also, Mufi, about, you know, other places, and this may be happening here too, hotel properties have been repurposed or are under consideration for repurposing. And there were essentially three repurposing that I can remember. Um, one is um, four COVID patients. Um, you know, who need to be separated, uh, say from family or uh, their, their regular living arrangements. Um, uh, they've been, you know, tested positive. Uh, secondly, sick people, like you move hospital facilities into a hotel property uh, when you don't have any room. I don't think we have the problem of uh, shortage of facilities right now, but, you know, in the second wave, uh, we will talk about that. That could happen. And the third possibility is the homeless who are so, so much more exposed uh, in the time of in the time of COVID. Are any hotels doing that or is, is there any incentive for them to do that? Um, would that work if necessary? Uh, or are they are they rather prefer not to do that? Oh well, let me answer the question too is there's some things that we are doing on our own to repurpose. Uh, for example, uh, with respect to for the Hotel for Heroes program because when they come in they're not guests uh, in terms of being able to check in uh, and be able to kind of go out to the lobby or traipse around. They are told specifically that if you're going to take us up on a free room uh, at one of the hotels you have to self-isolate uh, and uh, therefore that means you can't say you know I wanted to step up for a bite you have to order room service uh, or in the case of Domino's Pizza and uh, Mike Rompel is making pizzas available once a week uh, to our heroes. So that's one thing. The other part of it, as you indicated, you know, government can mandate that of us. And so uh, if, if they feel the need uh, to do that, obviously uh, there will be uh, opportunities to have hotels set aside for those purposes. I know uh, from the hospital point of view, uh, the convention center uh, has been made available. Uh, if that's what they need to do. Uh, I know that the Blaisdell Center Arena is all, not the arena, the exhibition hall has mm. been an area where they could do that also. So because of the emergency powers that the governor has and Haima, they could basically designate that. And if they do, uh, obviously uh, a hotel will have to comply. Uh, 
Uh, there has been conversations from some hotels that I've talked to who said that they're willing to do that, whether it's COVID-19 uh, or whether it's housing the homeless or even domestic violence, if that happens. But once again, for those things to happen, uh, you can't expect the hotel to pay for those expenses. No, no. So to Somebody's got to step up. Yeah. Uh, government, local governments being able to foot the bill. And then uh, if uh, folks that are staying there uh, lend itself to the fact that sometimes uh, things happen there where uh, furniture is, uh, is, is broken or things and so forth, then the state will have to come and pay for that. And most importantly, the, clean, the cleanliness and sanitation aspect of that will also be, have to be picked up uh, by government. And I think that's only uh, fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, go, go back to an earlier point. Uh, we're in a, a period of, of change, and this is all dynamic. And um, everybody uh, says that uh, when we come out of the pipeline on this, um, things will be different. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's the issue about when exactly, how do we come out of the pipeline? Uh, you mentioned before that, um, you know, health is first, public health is first, and then rebuilding the economy is second. I certainly agree. I, I think most, most right-thinking people will agree with that. But assuming that we are satisfied uh, that public health is under control, uh, that's, that, and that's a very subjective, uh, less than scientific decision, public policy decision. Assuming that moment, how do you open the gates, Mufi? How do you reopen the tourist economy? This is the central question. How in the world can we restart Hawaii's tour tourism industry? If I say to you, I'm the governor and I want, I want to start it now, now's the time, what do you do? What does the industry do to restart? Well, I think we'll have to do our own internal uh, evaluation of, uh, it's one thing to open the hotels, but if the airlines are not operating in the manner uh, which we feel is sufficiently to satisfy us that whoever we are accepting the hotels are, are going to be tested or screened or what have you, uh, then it's going to be very uncomfortable for us to do so. I don't think the governor would issue such an edict if he didn't have some kind of guarantees on that end. Having said that, I think we're going to have to understand that this is going to be a gradual process. Uh, we cannot expect for all the workers to employ be uh, employed again, 100%, uh, just like I think hotel occupancy will start at maybe 20% and it'll go 30% and 40%. We're not gonna see uh, what were the numbers that we were seeing in February uh, for quite some time. So the question is that when we start to reopen, my guess is that government will probably try to do it incrementally. We'll start to lift some restrictions. Uh, maybe some counties are more ready to go forward than others, but that's a decision for the big five to make, that's the four mayors uh, and the governor. Having said that, uh, I hope there will be consultation uh, with the industry, not just with the hotels, but the attractions, the restaurants, the retail merchants, uh, all the key stakeholders, the transportation companies, uh, so that we can all be ready together, uh, as opposed to one part of the industry being ready and then they come here, okay, uh, airlines have done a good job to bring you here, we're doing a good job in hotels, but yet the attractions are not ready to receive them because they'll say, hey, I thought you said aloha later. I got here and this is still not open or this is not ready to go operate. So mm. it's going to require a lot of coordination. So the one thing I would say to our government officials, I've been warned that hat before as mayor, consult, cooperate, and collaborate with the community and the private sector and the unions because that's the only way we can make the transition seamless uh, and doable. And we are looking to government for leadership in that area uh, to provide for us because they're the ones that are uh, implementing all the laws. So I know there's a lot of frustrating frustration out there because you know, one day this order is issued, then it's rescinded or then it's amended, what have you. Uh, so we're trying to be very, very patient, but recognizing that sooner or later, we got to start employing people. Sooner or later, we got to start operating again. I think this also should help, I'm hoping, Assuage those of us who felt that there's too many tourists coming to Hawaii and that over-tourism was rampant. Well, if anything now, responsible, sustainable tourism has to be the order of the day. And I think there's also has to be a recognition that this economy, as much as those who are saying, let's go back to sustainable agriculture, or let's just do a local economy. 
it's not going to get very far, Jay, and you know that as well as I do. Uh, if people are employed in the hospitality industry represent the greatest numbers, how do you really kickstart a local economy if they're not working? And if we can only bring back 20% of the workforce, or 30%, and there's another 70% out there, uh, that has, there has to be a balance. So there has to be a parallel path between starting up the local economy and then at some point also opening up our doors again. And you only start up the local economy if you feel that people here are not uh, are virus-free, if you will, and that we're going to maintain standards and all the things that we need to do. Keep the social distancing in place. Uh, keep the mask uh, in, in place. Uh, you know, whatever. The sanitizers, obviously. All of those things. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about this. You know, that, that there are there's always a drumbeat of people who say we have too much tourism. Uh, we should we should diversify the economy. It's been going on for decades, right? Um, diversify the economy, get into something else. Uh, who knows what? Say technology, agriculture, you name it. Um, and and they're also saying that my 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 ears are telling me um, that when you come through. Uh, a transformation, um, a, um, a crisis like this, uh, things will be different. And they're saying, uh, why don't we make the balance of the economy different uh, after, after the crisis is over? Why don't we try to diversify in the process of recovering from the crisis? Um, and that means a, a smaller percentage of the economy goes to the traditional tourism and a larger percentage goes to diversified industry, whatever that may be. What do you say to those people, Mufi? Um, are they right? Do they have a point? Uh, how can we assuage their concern? I think we should always be opening, open to new ideas and every crisis presents an opportunity. But even if we were to find a new uh, industry uh, or a new initiative for Hawaii, it's going to take time to ramp that up. Uh, that's just the order of the day. And so what do you have in place now that will keep people employed? Once again, some people don't want to hear this, but it's the visitor industry and it's defense. So those are our two largest industries and of course, construction. That being said, uh, uh, I think it would be very open, or I should say not just from a hotel perspective, but I think it's a resident of Hawaii, uh, but I have been in, uh, involved or participant in every economic diversification initiative since I first started with Governor Ariyoshi back in the 80s. And many great ideas have come forward to diversify the economy, and it still comes back uh, to the tourism industry. We happen to be a world-class brand. We have leading experts here that know how to do tourism. So I, uh, I would welcome new initiatives, new ideas, but even if we found something, it will take a while. And then here's the other thing. That industry has to overnight contribute what the hotel industry or what the visitor industry does to our economy. The uh, seven of the nine top property taxpayers, for example, in the city county of Honolulu, are hotels and resorts. Seven out of nine, six out of nine are hotels and resorts. Uh, where do you replace that? Where do you replace the income that comes in from the transit accommodation tax? Uh, where 600 million plus, only 85 million of that goes to marketing. Only 85 million of that almost 600 million plus, where the rest of that money goes is to the general fund, the biggest recipient and other aspects, assistance to the counties, paying for the convention center. So that is what has to be taken into account if we're going to do something like this. Uh, I wouldn't uh, give up at all. I mean, I think we've always said science, space and astronomy, I thought was a great place to go, but now with Mauna Kea being uh, stymied somewhat, uh, that's a decision not to the private industry, but obviously being respectful of the Hawaiian cultural concerns. And then the governor has to make that decision at the state level. You know, Mufi, uh, your role in the city council years ago, when you and I first met, um, and your role as mayor, um, and um, it, it, it prepared you so perfectly for HLTA. Um, but I wonder... You know, when you took the job with HLTA, it, it, it seemed like a natural progression. Um, on the other hand, who in the world uh, could have anticipated that this would happen? And that you'd be sitting here now talking to me about rebuilding the tourist economy. In one minute, what's your reaction to that? Well, you know, uh, it's in my DNA to try to help, to try to improve, to bring all my experiences. 
uh, to bear. Uh, and having been a mayor, I had to deal with the economic recession back in 2008, 2009. And we came through of that very nicely. So every job that I've had prepares me for the next one. I'm just very grateful to have an opportunity to try to contribute. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Mufi. I hope to see you here again soon, uh, either as guest or host, so we can you know, further explore these issues. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Mahalo. Aloha. Thank you.